Charles Adler, Dean Blundell. One day. One day only. Ah, welcome back. Nice to see everybody. Hi, my name is Dean. Still? Same name my whole life. One of those people that doesn't change their names, unlike uh, people in the Witness Protection Program and uh, Canadian politicians. Welcome to the program. Uh, there's the beautiful voice that I've been waiting to hear all week long. Mr. Charles Adler joins us from the Charles Adler podcast. Uh, this is reprogrammed where we challenge each other's thinking and old thinking and talk about new thinking. And there's lots of new thinking going on. But to that point, you've had uh, y- y- your radio guy, uh, your radio name, which you've adopted, Charles. We've talked about this. Uh, no. A long time ago, I didn't. I had a first radio name. It was James Dean. It was the dumbest radio name ever. James Dean. Yeah, I was so stupid. That I didn't <laughs> give it to myself. <clears throat> but we watch a lot of politicians do this, specifically in Alberta. Marlena Kolodnicki, uh is the actual name of the premier of that province. That she goes by Danielle Smith, and of course uh, Pierre Polyev. Uh, was known as Jeff during the formative years of his life. Uh, that seems to have gone by the wayside. Not a lot of information there. Do you have a problem on its face voting for anybody that goes by a fake name? Yes or no? Yes or no? No, because uh, it's a brand and uh, I have uh, blood on my hands. Use that expression a time or two with you. <laughs> and it was my job when I was a middle manager, when I was a program director. Yeah. It was my job to get people acceptable names. That was, yeah. the, that was the language that was used back then. Is that had, that was part of your gig? Is you yeah, had to help like people yeah, with bad yeah, radio names to, come up with I, better radio names? I had to be a tyrant about it. You're you're not going on the air and, unless uh, uh, you change your name, and I'll help you change your name. And I, I often, you know, named them. And, yeah. Uh, people go, "What are you talking about? Are you talking about the slave trade? Were you working in Charleston in the 19th century? No, no. This was this was Canada, specifically uh, in in Western Canada. Yeah. Very much in the 21st century in the uh, I guess the 1980s was 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 the last time I was uh, changing people's names, and what's that? Forty some, you know, a little yeah. over forty years ago. Forty years so ago. So relatively relatively recent, unless you're 20 years old. In that case, it's ancient history. But we would change people's names because, and the, I'm, I'm going to use the language that we used back then. I know that today every 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 word is offensive to this and offensive to that. So I'm just going to speak English here. Um, the word was ethnic. If you had an ethnic name. In mm-hmm. other words, if it wasn't an Anglo-Saxon name, because uh, that's why Pierre Pauly uh, at, at one point said something about the language he uses is plain is Anglo-Saxon, Anglo-Saxon language. Anglo-Saxon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was that nice was the word tip. we used back then. That it had to be an Anglo-Saxon name, mm-hmm. and uh, so uh, I remember there was. Uh, and I'm not going to mention the name of the person because not not wanting to embarrass them, and they're still in the, in the business. But I remember changing a certain young woman's uh, name, and uh, her her dad was absolutely livid, not with her, but with me. Uh, and it was um, it was it was nasty. I mean, you know, her dad just wanted to, you know, get out the shotgun and and do what they do to varmints in uh, yeah. in Western Canada. As far as he was concerned, I was a varmint because I was changing his uh, his daughter's last name, which of course was his last name, which was his grandfather's last name is source of pride yeah so i was i was mucking i was mucking with the heritage but i just uh the name was was unacceptable and uh and oddly enough uh, years later when she had certainly had the opportunity to go back to using her own name uh, she didn't she didn't do that so uh you know to give you the long answer to the short question because i have blood on my hands and i have changed the people's names to give their name a, a more acceptable brand something that's yeah. easier to pronounce for the uh, overwhelming majority of, of listeners or viewers if uh, jeff wanted to change his name to pierre i could care less i i think i when i met him he wasn't jeff he was definitely pierre because I, I vaguely vaguely remember you know shaking hands with him and uh, talking to him for a few minutes he was considered a a wonderkind in uh, political science in at the university of calgary and i was doing a lot of shows out of Calgary. And that's where I met him. And mm-hmm. that's where I met Danielle Smith. Now, Danielle Smith, we we actually put on the air, uh, put on the TV show. I, I, I don't think we put Pierre Polyev on the air, but uh, I, I talked to him for a little bit. And I, I just felt I was talking to a robot. 
And I think that's one of the reasons why I mean, an intelligent robot, I'm not saying he was not, he's definitely not, not a stupid person. I'm never going to call him, call him that. He was a smart, smart person. As I say, he was a, a uh, wonder Kendi was one of the, the, the top of the class. And that's why I met him and, and some other people. But, um, uh, how long ago was that? How long that ago was, did you meet him? I'll, I'll tell you specifically when that was, that would have been, uh, just after nine 11. So that would have been either 2001 or probably, probably 2002. So, uh, do the math. I met him 22 years ago mm -hmm. and I was impressed with his, his brain is, is, you know, his uh, natural brain. He was very, very smart, very brainy, but he had a, uh, what I would call, uh, a, a difficult, a difficult personality. And the most obvious aspect of his personality was zero empathy. And so I tend, and I, I, I'm wrong from time to time. Even back then, you, 22 years ago, just yeah, from a conversation, yeah, yeah, you got just, that he was yeah. just an automaton. No, yeah, no yeah. He was, he was someone who, who, who was someone who's terrific at memorizing. Yeah. He was great at memorizing lines. That was obvious. Uh, uh, but it was very artificial. It was very robotic, very no empathy. And sometimes in, in this life, I have made the mistake of thinking that people who have no empathy are not going to be successful at being public brands, you know, faking empathy is, is really difficult. Some people say things like, oh, you know, I did, you know, once you fake, uh, once you can fake empathy, 90% uh, of the, the rest of the journey is downhill. It's very, very difficult over the a long period of time to, to fake empathy. I did not know that someday we would be living in an era where people actually enjoy uh, cruelty, a uh, coldness, frigidity, an Arctic personality. I, I had no idea that someday we'd be living in 2024 and 2024 would be a, a year where it's perfectly acceptable for a public figure uh, to be either lacking in empathy or certainly appearing to be lacking empathy. And he, he makes his bones by trashing uh, the other side. And when he does trash the other side, specifically when he trashes the prime minister, nobody has a hard time believing that he has 100% disdain for the prime minister, because the truth is this person has 100% disdain for anyone who isn't marching uh, alongside him, preferably from his perspective, behind him. That's the uh, impression I have of Pierre Polyev. And so my impression really hasn't changed in, in 22 years. Call me old fashioned, but I believe my instincts. Mm, yeah, well, your instincts, uh, you know, are based on not just words that you've spoken with the gentleman, but the works of this individual. And you've known him and met him 22 years ago. Uh, makes it makes it kind of all the more disconcerting that we are where we are. 19 points up in most polls between 18 and 20 points uh, stands to win a majority in this country. And it's some of the questions that I think a lot of people are asking today, Chuck. And I, and I think, you know, it goes a long way to have someone like you that, as you point out, has blood on your hands. You know the people, but you also know what's at stake. You know, there's this competing narrative from individuals in this country, the average voter, that, you know, you get to choose between nice and not nice, mm -hmm. good and evil, right? Canada's institutions are as such that I don't I'm not necessarily overly concerned for my safety if a guy like Pierre Polyev becomes the prime minister. But I've seen nothing from him that would make me feel comfortable with him as the leader of this country representing us because he said nothing about what he's going to be doing for the people of this country. Just that if you keep voting for Justin Trudeau, your life is going to be over. Your kids are going to turn gay. All those beautiful tropes and slogans that you know, MAGA and Maple MAGA like to repeat. But right. that, that's the question I would ask, and I think a good place to start. Sure. You know this individual. You know the disingenuous attitude, the lack of empathy. You see how unpalatable that is uh, just when we see him on television reciting something, going after a reporter, basing reputations of institutions, media institutions, Canadian institutions. Are you concerned? Like, and, I'm, and, and I know I've asked you that question before, but do you think that he wants to make radical changes do you think that canada will become like trump 2016 through 20 or or do you think that this is just ballyhoo do you think this is just posturing for votes yeah, money I, I don't I, I i tend not to get scared of uh, changes in in our democracy because i believe strongly in our institutions so i think we have safeguards i think we have guardrails i i also don't think he's that serious a person he is serious about becoming prime minister. He's serious about 
doing the gig. He loves all of the, the trappings. That's why I laugh at some of this popular stuff that he does every now and then he gets caught out. Like he'll call, um, you know, sort of a, a lower middle class home. He'll call it a shack because mm -hmm. from his perspective, it's just a shack. And mm -hmm. then he tries to go back to being a man of the common people and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so no, I, I believe he wants the trappings. I believe he wants the gig. I believe he wants the perks. I believe he wants to be on the, the world stage and all of that. But do I believe that he uh, is a radical and wants to wants a radical transformation of Canada uh, to be that kind of you know really consequential figure? He redid Canada. No, I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't believe. You don't think the, he wants to turn Canada into an authoritarian state? No, no, no. no. And I, I think that when I think when um, his political opponents say that, I think they end up uh, jumping the shark. I think that they actually help him more than, than hinder him. I think that uh, if they if they want to beat him, uh, they should talk about specifics that he he might want to do. He might want to trash uh, childcare. He might want to diversify healthcare, privatize a lot of it, and uh, and and that plays differently in in different precincts in this country, yeah. in different neighborhoods, um, with different demographics. But I, I think uh, if they want to talk about the specifics that uh, he would happily uh, get rid of, that's fine. Uh, but if they want to tell people that he wants to turn Canada into Putin's Russia, I think that's interesting stuff uh, for podcasting, uh, for opinion columns, uh, you know, for, for Twitter. But I think it's a load of trash. Um, again, next question, because I don't disagree with you. I think a lot of the rhetoric or talking points, especially when you've got extreme rhetoric that breathes nothing but fear into large groups of people, right? It's psyop stuff. It's alternative reality stuff. And that's how you create an alternative reality. You convince a group of rubes um, that things are a certain way. And, you know, it happens from both sides. To your point, Pierre Polyev did it. Andrew Coyne called it out. You put out a tweet about it as sure. well. But this is the kind of stuff I'm talking about, like, you know, being able to gin up votes with legitimate bullshit. Uh, and he's been doing it for some time. That's the wrong thing. We'll get to Navalny in a second. Yeah. Uh, Polyev puts out the front page of uh, Post Media, National Post, which is firmly a conservatively funded newspaper. Yeah, and, and uh, by the way, when, 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 when you say that, or, or I say, or others say that, uh, folks, that's, that's not an opinion. That, that's a fact. They are proud to be uh, the uh, most widely read platform of movement conservatives in this country. There's, there's no way that I, mean, I could have any of that. I know a bunch of them, just like I know a bunch of Polyev's crew. I could I could put any one of them on the air and, and not one of them or on a podcast and not one of them would deny that they see themselves as a platform for movement conservatism. That, they yeah, it's a, they it's reject a the idea that they're a, a tool of Polyev, but they certainly don't reject the idea that they are a voice of, of Canadian conservatism. No, it, 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 and they, they proudly do it. It is a vertical in what they do. It is how they get funding. They hire conservative-leaning operatives or journalists. That's We all know that. That's what Post Media does. It's what they're all about, the Sun, the National Post, et cetera. So thank you for saying that. Um, Polyev puts out a screen cap of a tweet. Uh, Adam Pankratz, one of the conservative journalists saying anti-road Guibo drives down the slippery slope to climate tyranny. The environment minister wants Canada to de-industrialize. Now, this is over him saying that Canada wasn't going to put a bunch of money into some new road infrastructure. So then they take that, they gaslight, they run. And Pierre Polyev feeds the conspiracy to the masses. Justin Trudeau's radical environment. Everybody's <laughs> radical. Eh? I love his Mr. Yeah, the word The word where it works. Yeah, it really does. Trudeau's radical environment minister uh, decisions to end road building is part of a plan to deindustrialize. Again, course, another fucking catchphrase and slogan: <laughs> deindustrialize, radical minute, deindustrialize Canada. We're going back to the dark ages. <laughs> Make us reliant on foreign dictatorships to sell things to our government to ban us from making it home. I had no idea you were reduced to just working with foreign dictatorships if you're going to deindustrialize. But okay, uh, to stop Trudeau's no more roads plans. Sign up here and give us some money. Yeah. Is that yeah, what it's all that, about? That, that, yeah, but, well, that, that's what it's about because, uh, you know, Andrew Andrew Coyne calls them rubes, you know, it's just a, a nice term for, for people who are low information. That's another, I guess, politically correct term that we use, uh, I guess, a word that's... Oh, you call, yeah, you call them something else. That, I call them idiots. Yeah, a, yeah, a, yeah, a word that's totally less, uh, you know, uh, a, a little a little more to the point is, yeah. is ignorant or, or people who want to who choose to be ignorant. I've said this a million times. 
Many of the people who love this stuff, who lap it up, are not ignorant people. They're uh, successful people and they're educated people, but they love hating on Trudeau. And if someone wants to come along and say that that uh, Trudeau has a hidden agenda uh, to, you know, send us to the dark ages, uh, you know, we'll, we'll just be walking everywhere. I, I love I love hearing uh, people repeat that stuff in, in Western Canada uh, because, uh, you know, like in, in Manitoba, where I live, uh, m- most people either have a cottage or have a friend who has a cottage and going to the cottage is a very big deal in the summer because winters are, are rather uh, rugged in, in Western Canada. And so the idea of walking to the cottage, walking to 200 kilometers is, is kind of, I mean, it's just, it's just funny. I mean, I have to laugh well, about it. Me you too. Know? I mean, you know, like yeah. the, the, go to the 15 minute city thing, anything they can glom <laughs> on to, to say, this is going to happen to you. You're going to have a right. terrible time. You know, the 15 minute city thing that they rallied around that conservatives, Pierre, Polly, everybody. And they told people what their fate would be if, but you you're, know, you, you know, know, you're, you're, you're in T.O. where, I, you know, I lived, uh, you know, for certain parts of my life, I guess overall, I, I lived in the, you know, greater Toronto area for yeah. at least a dozen years, uh, did uh, several tours of duty there. And uh, one of the things that I, I didn't uh, like about Toronto is I was very spoiled in Montreal. The cottage was an hour away. And in Toronto, the cottage was three hours away and four hours away. Five hours away. That that you know, I did. I, I didn't like that. Of course, in in Western Canada, the cottage can be anywhere from forty minutes away uh, to three hours away. Uh, but uh, the thing is that most most Canadians uh, do love uh, going to to cottage country. And the idea that we'll give up on cars, <laughs> we're not walking to the cottage. So the the point is, it, it's stupid. Yeah. It's stupid in Quebec. But it's people buy it, dude. Like that's yeah. the thing. People are like, oh. Yeah. they're seriously going to have to right. hand out permits to us for us to go get groceries and we're not allowed to own a car. That's the a- way anyway, the, the whole, the whole thing is stupid, but people who want to hate on the other side who aren't necessarily stupid, they love this stupid stuff that, that Polyev is, is selling and, and Andrew coin, you know, said it right. You know, Hey Rubes, I got a, I got a pile of conspiracy theory nonsense for you. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, wrong tweet again. Uh, attention, Rubes. Used conspiracy theories on sale now. All makes, all models. Just send money. You know, and, and it's funny because like three years ago, I would have gone, what the, what, what is that? Like, what an irresponsible thing to do. And now when I see it, I'm like you and coin where I'm like, oh, yeah, here we go. <laughs> That's a good. Wait, one. Wait, wait, you can wait, only wait. laugh at it, right? Like if right, you but, if you understand the end result, what what's been the, but the I beginning up? Just like just like I can't take seriously the idea that a liberal government, whether it's run by Trudeau or anyone else, it would actually stop building roads because uh, they're, 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 I've never met the politician who didn't love building roads because it's always a popular vote getter. You you cut the ribbon, you open the road. It's a very big deal. You get the lead story on the six o'clock news. You know, there might be a tornado coming through town that might get ahead of you, but unless there is a, a tornado, an earthquake, some kind of blizzard, some kind of important weather event, you are the lead story on the six o'clock local news when you cut the ribbon to a brand new bridge, a brand new road, brand new piece of infrastructure that always, always, always requires fossil fuel vehicles to be used. So Stephen Guibault represents nothing. I mean, he represents a, a sliver of humanity. I had no idea why Trudeau wants to have him on as, as minister. It's a joke. Uh, a blague, c'est a blague. That's a joke in French. It's a blague in, in, in English. It's a blague in French. It's just ridiculous. I've said before on on different shows that uh, Stephen Guibault, the environment minister, is, is Santa Claus every day for Pierre Polyev. Even if Polyev didn't have a personality, even if he didn't have a digital crew, even if he didn't have anything uh, going on, all he'd have to do is quote uh, Stephen Guibault every week and say, this is the hidden agenda of, uh, of, of the Liberal government. And if the Liberal government wants to stop having uh, Stephen Guibault as the hidden agenda target, uh, they could just uh, fire him and, and, and replace him with a, a fire hydrant because a fire hydrant would do a better job than mm-hmm. Stephen Guibault, who's a wonderful activist and he's he's an expert at, at climate change, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But what the hell does that have to do with the price of peas? What the hell does that have to do with retail uh, politics? Stephen Guibault is useless at retail politics, and I would say that in English, French, Hungarian, whatever language I have access to. And um, like I say, I, I don't want to, I don't want to sit here and, and pretend that Stephen Guibault has any real power that Stephen Guibault is going to, you know, stop the, the trains from running on time and stop yeah. roads from 
being built and stop Canada from being Canada. And if some conservative wants to come along and say, oh, no, 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 uh, Trudeau is really into this. Uh, you got to walk everywhere. Like, yeah, like Trudeau doesn't fly planes, you know, every day. Like, 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 like Trudeau doesn't get into uh, fossil fuel vehicles every day to get where he wants. Oh, no, Trudeau's going to change his whole life and become some, some backpacking green activist. I mean, yeah. just, it's just nonsense. And, uh, and, and, but the nonsense gets clicks and mm -hmm. dollars. Yep, clicks, dollars, fear. That's the whole point. Alexei Navalny was murdered uh, this week by Vladimir Putin. Um, the response from different corners of the world, depending on you know their political stripes, what they align with, has been different. Uh, first, your thoughts on Navalny's death, uh, and then we'll get to some of the Canadian responses uh, today and what it, what it kind of means. You know, it, it, it's it. I I I never like if you if you've watched the Navalny documentary and I watched it prior to his death. I'm like, there's no way Putin can kill this guy because the entire country will like literally go nuts if if they do. And and that was sort of Navalny's plan. His plan was to be as public as he possibly could to make it impossible for Putin or anybody from the FSB or in his inner circle to take him out. He actually said that prior to his death. That's what he thought would work. His family thought, well, no, it didn't work. He was murdered in an Arctic prison, I think 200 miles north of Moscow, uh, the age of 47. His only real political opponent has now been taken out. Um, so I want to just get your precursor thoughts, and then we'll get, uh, get to some of the reaction. So he was uh, likely poisoned. Uh, he had been poisoned before unsuccessfully this time. There's no doubt that he was poisoned successfully because overall his overall health was fine. He was uh, 47 years old. Um, so he was uh, likely uh, poisoned under you know orders from the, uh, Putin and his uh, cronies in, in the Kremlin, and that's why when somebody someone says he was murdered, I don't think you have to have a a trial to declare this. Uh, and if you want to be absolutely technically correct, uh, you don't have to say he was murdered. You can say that the Putin administration, the Putin dictatorship, or the Putin government, if you choose to put it that way, is uh, responsible for the death of Navalny. He was likely poisoned, and that's why they're not releasing the body. It's going to take the, a few weeks uh, for the, the, the poison uh, to not be uh, traceable. At the moment, of course, it would be and they don't want any uh, coroner, they don't want anyone who they don't absolutely trust uh, looking at that body and, and doing uh, the autopsy, etc. So his mother is not uh, allowed. His mother is begging Putin to have access to the body of her, her late son. Yeah, did you see her video that she yeah. put out? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. sad. So, so that's, what's, that's what's going on in Russia. And, of course, what's going on in the U.S. and Canada and the U.K. is uh, members of the right, some want to call them the far right, but... Members, members of the right still want to carry water for Putin and uh, his uh, his propaganda, and so they uh, they don't know what to say about Navalny. Uh, they say uh, ridiculous things. I mean, Trump said the most ridiculous thing the other day. Uh, Trump said that he is Navalny, that uh, he is being treated uh, by Joe Biden uh, and the Democrats that they, they that he's being treated uh, the way uh, Navalny was treated by Putin. I mean, I, I don't like to use. The word offensive because everybody uses it all the time uh so i'll i'll, I'll just say hideous mm. it's it's absolutely hideous uh, for me as a small d democrat as a as an embracer of canadian democracy small l liberal uh, democracy anywhere in the world and that's what navalny stood for uh to have uh, someone like uh, trump who at one time was the most powerful human being on the planet uh, say that he is being treated like uh, Alexei Navalny, it's 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 gross. Now, as far as uh, why Putin is so popular with certain members of the right, it has absolutely nothing to do with uh, Navalny, nothing to do with the Gulag of Siberia poisoning the enemies. That's not what it is. Uh, Putin is the latest poster boy for what is uh, sometimes politely called Christian nationalism. Mm -hmm. Now, in my opinion, the Christianity has nothing to do with it in, in the sense of you know, if you ask the question, what would Jesus do? I don't think Jesus would see uh, uh, the Putin uh, as, as a righteous figure. But there is an element of, let's call it orthodox, really strict orthodox Christianity or, or fundamentalist Christianity that really likes Putin, at least followers of fundamentalist and orthodox Christianity like him uh, because he's white. Mm -hmm. And uh, virtually all of his uh, colleagues are white. Virtually all of his colleagues are white male, and uh, 
and and they're homophobic and there are a whole lot of other things that appeal uh, to, uh, to to people who are orthodox uh, Christians or to leaders of various orthodox uh, Christian movements. And so the polite term, I guess, is Christian nationalism. Mm -hmm. Those uh, conservatives in the States and elsewhere who think of themselves as Christian nationalists are the ones who don't just want to outlaw abortion. Uh, if they had their druthers, they would outlaw birth control pills. Uh, they would outlaw, you know, women being able to burst through the, the glass ceiling. They, they would mm -hmm. want to go back to the, the 19th century. That's what uh, Putin represents symbolically for, for so many of them. And uh, that's, I think, at the core, the reason they support him. They don't care about Navalny. They don't care about democracy. They don't care about uh, Siberia. They don't even care about dictatorship, really. Uh, they just want to figure out how to have a country uh, that uh, has white males uh, large and in charge. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> echoed by the plight of the Feenstra family, by the way. Uh, if you remember, this gentleman moved his entire family. We talked about him last week. Talked about him on the podcast yesterday. His name's Aaron Feenstra. Moved from Ontario, family of 10. The oldest child stayed home because he is an Orthodox Christian nationalist who believes that Russia was the place for him and his family. So he literally sold everything, moved over there. Now, there's an update. You can go to Cryer Media, get the update on this story. Massive story. And um, the update is that uh, the Feenstras, as soon as they got there, had every dollar they had in their Canadian bank account transferred into a Russian bank account and cannot access it, cannot buy food, um, cannot uh, literally put out a video last week complaining about what's going on. Him and his wife, his wife was livid, basically said they've been lied to. Uh, yesterday, Mr. Feenstra put out an 18 minute long rambling video, which you can check out at Cryer Media. Um, of him effectively, and 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 you would know this as a guy that understands Compromat, is effectively going, okay, listen, I think our thoughts were misconstrued. Russia is a great place. I love Russia. My family loves Russia, 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 Russia. It's not the bank's fault. It's our fault. It's everybody else's fault, not just ours. It's nobody else's fault. Russia's the best. Putin's the best. It went on for 18 minutes. It went on for 18 minutes. And at the end of it, it was fascinating because he's like, by the way, we're going to introduce everybody to a whole bunch of people that came from the West that are now here in Russia because they stand up for real Christian values. Oh, by the way, here's a picture of my daughter celebrating her first birthday in Russia. That that was that was the video. Now, all the videos they put out with all their struggles have disappeared from the Internet. Right. So that's the freedom that they get. That's what they're supporting. And there's literally like this, like catfishing exercise going on from Russia. And it's part of the propaganda, which is fascinating to me, to bring people from Western democracies into their country, promise them a bunch of stuff, get them to make videos on their channels and sanitize those videos and have those pushed back out to make it look like what, to your point, this is the motherland for Christian nationalism, for that Orthodox. And I'm not talking about Christians. You and I know a bunch of Christians. I come from a Christian family. There are wonderful Christian people out there who don't have this crazy, hateful Orthodox bent. There are lots of them. These are the extremes of the extremes. Yeah, they are, just, so, just so we're clear, uh, the overwhelming majority of sure. Christians are, are not like this at all. But the no. people who are like this at all, they're the ones who lead with Christian, Christian, Christian. I mean, that, that's what their whole yeah. life is about. And they give, let's, let's just say it clearly, they give Christians a bad name. Terrible name. And you can say the same thing about other Abrahamic faiths, too, and different derivatives and uh, denominations of it, is that extreme version misrepresents the whole. To that point, the misrepresentation of what Russia is, that gets echoed here as well. Some of the talking points that we see from people pushing back against, you know, in the case of the Conservative Party of Canada, and to loop them back into this conversation, voting against aid for Ukraine definitely helps Russia. Mike Lee in the United States holding up aid for Ukraine definitely helps Russia. Back to the Navalny thing, if I could tie these things in, Pierre Polyev's statement after Navalny was murdered, to your point about death and murder, largely feckless. And I want to read it to you, and I want, to, I want Charles Adler's interpretation of what he sees here, Charles. Um, this is his official statement. This is, of course, the same gentleman aligns and his party aligns with the same ideological bent of, you know, radical gender ideology. Trans people are no good. We need to do this. We got 
the same thing. He's, he, he repeats and stands for the same thing Russia stands for, whether it's the convoy, whether it's disrupting democracy in this country, whether it's hate filled trolls and bots, they all support each other. So his comment on the Navalny death, the murder was, quote, Russian opposition Alexei Navalny has died in prison. Putin imprisoned Navalny for the act of opposing the regime. Conservatives condemn Putin for his death. Your thoughts? Because he's getting dragged by a bunch of people. It is a statement. But in statements, there aren't many people that can read into those statements better than you. And I'd love to get your thoughts on it. Well, I've, I've got to tell you that it, it's still a lot better than what uh, Polyev or whoever writes the tweets, whatever they put out, whatever the Conservative Party of Canada put out there, uh, is a lot better, uh, a lot closer to accuracy and honesty than what uh, Trump put out. You know, Trump uh, mentioned Navalny and then told the whole world that he was a Navalny and uh, that he had he showed absolutely no... No sympathy to Navalny, no sympathy for democracy, and there was no attack on, on Putin. So th this particular tweet, uh, they are linking Putin to the death of Navalny. Did they say that Putin murdered Navalny? No, but they certainly in this tweet say that uh, he is responsible for it. They certainly say why he was uh, uh, he was imprisoned. I mean, could could the could Polyev have gone farther? Uh, could uh, Polyev have gone farther with what uh, democracy is about and? that that's what Navalny was about and that uh, Putin is a, a threat to democracy and that Putin is a threat to democracy all over the world uh, because of all the disinformation that uh, Putin subsidizes and supports. Yeah, he could have done all those things. Uh, he didn't. But uh, as I say, in a, in a, in a world where we look at, you know, Why didn't relativity know? Rel relative to Donald Trump for if liberals want to say that uh, Polyev did exactly what Donald Trump would do, that would be inaccurate because we know what Donald Trump did, and Donald Trump did nothing. But why wouldn't he, in a country like Canada, why wouldn't he go all the way with a comment? Why wouldn't he say he was murdered? He can say you can, you know, Putin, you can hold him accountable, but you can arrow down to, you know, accountable because you're the president and it shouldn't yeah. have happened under your watch. But like a political dissident, a political opponent in a country of people that he shares a lot of ideological supporters with. Yeah. Well, because heard the, a dude, and he was like, I mean, eh, it happens. Well, the, the answer is is all the answer is inside everything else we've just talked about. Uh, Polyev doesn't want to piss off the uh, fundamentalist Christians, Orthodox Christians, uh, homophobic Christians, whatever you want to call them. He doesn't want to piss off the you know the the, the, the people who support that family who's trapped inside uh, Russia right now, because uh, call them what you will. You know, you can call them rubes. You can call them all kinds of things, but uh, Polyev calls them donors, and he mm -hmm. wants the donors. He wants he mm -hmm. wants the money, and uh, it doesn't matter whether the guy's name is Pierre Polyev or Stephen Harper. The conservative uh, leaders uh, have have wanted uh, to gain as much money as possible. They always outraise everyone else. They do much more, and they do much better at raising money. One of the reasons they raise a lot more money is they go after people like this, uh, people who who follow these the, the, these conspiracies and want to see themselves as Christian nationalists and those people contribute because those people feel that no other party ever courts them, wants them, embraces them, honors them, affirms them. And so the conservatives are, are their party. So they, they spend lots of money. And uh, whether, like I say, whether it's Stephen Harper or Pierre Polyev, they've always wanted to have lots of money because they want to have lots of money to spend on advertising, what some people yeah. call negative ads, hit ads on, on the liberals. You're going to see... Uh, you know, you've seen the massive amount of social media advertising. That's a, a drop in the ocean of the amounts of, of money that will be spent uh, next year uh, or later this year, but certainly in the next uh, 12 to 18 months uh, on, on the next election. And the ads will be graphic. Uh, they will be, yes, they'll be creative. They will be absolutely vicious and they will be buying lots of them. You'll see Stanley Cup playoff games where you'll see a conservative ad coming up every 10 minutes or 12 minutes, and it might be the same ad, might be the same vicious ad, but those things cost a lot of money, and that's why they're raising the money. The conservatives are very good at it. I can say a lot of things about the conservatives from a, a, a moral perspective, from a business, pure business point of view, the, the business of politics. The conservatives are absolutely number one at doing the business of politics, and all this stuff that we're talking about right now feeds into their business. Pierre Polyev is not losing any support, not losing any dollars, mm. not losing any clicks by not going farther 
on the Navalny thing. If I were consulting the conservatives, knowing exactly who they're after, what they're after, what their long-term goals are, I would have written a tweet no more fulsome than the one they wrote for him. Mm. Okay. Yeah. I, listen, there are a lot of people that are carving him saying he didn't go far enough. There are a lot of people that are like, he said enough. It doesn't really matter. Uh, but inside the reasoning behind the problem that you might have with what he said, you can kind of, you know, as, as, as ascertain bias, right? You can say, well, he did this because, you know, this is my guy or he didn't do enough because he's not my guy. And to your point, um, I don't disagree with you. Like, you know, I look at it from a perspective of values, though, right? When a political opponent of a murderous dictator, theocratic dictator, who's at war with the free world, at war with democracy, who's openly meddling in North American elections and politics, I look at it like, hmm, if you're a Canadian politician who stands to ascend to the prime minister's office, and it looks like he might, you would want to give your constituents, whether or not they were going to vote for you, possibly independence, you'd want to give them the comfort of being able to say, I categorically stand against the murder of political opponents in any country because I'm a political opponent here and I don't want that to come to our shores. That is the statement I'm looking for as a Canadian citizen if I don't have the bias I have and know right. that the guy has the values of a serial killer. If I was just a, an average voter, right? right? So that's my issue with it, and but it's here, a personal here, issue. Okay, but here, here's, here's what you need to know, and here's what everyone, I think, listening to this podcast needs to know. The Conservative Party in general, the leadership of the Conservative Party, feels that one of the things that makes the Liberals vulnerable to defeat is the Liberals have been hectoring and lecturing and moralizing for a decade now. And they feel that most Canadians don't want to be hectored, moralized to, lectured to. They don't, they don't want sermons from the Mount. Mm -hmm. They don't want Justin Trudeau to be delivering those sermons. They don't want anyone else to deliver them. That's how the Conservatives feel about the Liberals, and that's how they feel about Canadians. So the less moralizing... Uh, Pierre Polyev, or Pierre, it's not Pierre Polyev doesn't write his tweets. I mean, the, the less moralizing they do, the, the conservatives do on these tweets, the better it is for them. That's how they see it. And as I say, they're playing the game of politics better than anyone else right now. You may object to the game. Mm -hmm. I may object to the game, but I'm never going to come to this microphone and this camera denying what I know. Yeah. Distraction. It's a distraction that works. It's, uh, I mean, and they're masterful at it. Uh, and, and you know what? It's funny because I look at a lot of the issues that get put in front of us, fear porn issues, right? Calling people radical, calling this radical, calling that guy a tyrant, calling this yeah. guy a dictator. And I used to be like everybody else, probably about five, six years ago, where you're like, is this guy an idiot? <laughs> like, what? Are you serious? And then I take umbrage to it. You go through the phases of like disbelief in Canadian politics that this kind of stuff, pure out and out lies could happen. Pure out and out bullshit, like graphs and memes that are wholly untrue and rage baiting and the fighting and the gaslight, all that other stuff. And, you know, for a long time, we in Canada really were like, Man, I'm jealous of American elections. They're so exciting, and there's so much content. There's so many affairs, and there's so much espionage. It's so much more entertaining. And then I look at Donald Trump's four years, and I'm like, man, that was like content in the can for people for a long period of time. With a guy like Pierre Polyev, am I disingenuous, or is it bad for Canada for me to say, hey, listen, if Pierre Polyev wins, knowing the content of his character, this might be the most entertaining four years in political media in this country ever if he gets in. Well, I, I think a lot of people who are in public media, and by public media, I just mean, you know, media that, that is servicing the public. It doesn't matter whether it's CBC or, or CTV or any others, broadcasters, podcasters. There are many people who are looking forward to being uh, in a country that's governed by Pierre Polyev because many of them feel it's it's going to be a clown show. Mm -hmm. Many feel uh, some of his cabinet ministers are, 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 are clowns and they're going to be giving, uh, you know, the media a, a lot of fodder. And uh, the media is, you know, bored uh, of the liberals. I, I love hearing all of this 
nonsense from my conservative friends about how the, the media is in tank with the liberals, all that. That's nonsense. You know, read, read the pages of any of, of the newspapers. Uh, listen to uh, most of the comments that, that come from, from most media people all, all across the country. I mean, the idea that these people are all in a tank with Justin Trudeau is ridiculous. Yeah. Most of them are like, like a lot of other people. They're, they're bored with a, a, a certain style, a certain governance uh, for almost a decade. Most people feel that uh, we've had a liberal decade. And a lot of media people are looking forward to the clown show. A lot of people uh, in Canadian media are envious of those in American media who had the four-year clown show of uh, Yeah, you could sell more Trump. streams, you could yeah, sell more yeah. newspapers, more clicks when yeah, you've got people, a legitimate clown pay, in office. More, more people will pay attention to government. Yeah. If, if if the government is 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 a little more more clownish, I mean, you know the the, the problem with Stephen Guibault. I mean, I, I said earlier, Stephen Guibault, the environment minister, is, is Santa Claus for for Pierre Pauline every day. But Stephen Guibault is a really boring individual. Uh, you know, yeah. he just just is. Uh, and uh, the the guess is that that the individuals that uh, Pierre Pauline will have in in cabinet uh, will be intellectual lightweights for the most part. But they won't be boring. I mean, no. uh, I wouldn't be surprised if your friend, uh, I mean, I just think of her as, as Karen because she's Michelle Ferrari. Karen. Yeah, yeah, Michelle Ferrari. I mean, it, it, I don't I don't doubt that Michelle Ferrari from the, the Peterborough area will be in the Polyev cabinet if, if Pierre Polyev forms government. And Michelle Ferrari is, is, is Santa Claus for the media, not just every day, every right. hour. To your point. Here's Michelle Ferrari's latest video. She's a sitting member of parliament. Yeah. She might be a minister. She has no idea, dude. She has no idea how the different federal and provincial levels of government work. Yeah. Let's watch this together, shall we? And she. So, this is Ryan Moore, and if any of you are Ouch. connected to politics locally, you know that Ryan Moore seeked the conservative nomination. Sought. Sought. PC. Why don't you say conservative? Because it's different. One's provincial, one's federal. One calls themselves PCs and one calls themselves conservatives? Yeah. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Different leadership, different, yeah. But it's still the same party. No. No, it's not. What? No, they're two separate. So you're telling me the provincial liberals are different than the federal liberals? Yeah. And NDP, and, well, NDP's culture, but no, it's, they're separate. How so? That's why they selected a leader last night, the federal conservatives. How so? How are they different? Everything's different about it. Some of the policies, people, like a lot of the same, the same membership sometimes. Yeah. But sometimes it's not. The writings weren't always the same. I did not know that. Yeah, there, 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 is, no, there is no federal minister of education, but if there was, Michelle Ferrari, CPC MP in the Peterborough area, she would be the minister of education now. If if she were provincial, right? If she were an M, if she were an MPP, well, like I spent all this time in Ontario because I don't call them MLAs. You see, <laughs> a lot of West, a lot of my Western Canadian friends when they you know when it's a provincial representative in Ontario, they'll say an Ontario MLA. No, no, no. Yeah. Ontario, they're they're MPPs. Just like in what is it in Newfoundland? I think they're MNAs. I think yes. They're, that member member of the National Assembly. Anyway, yes. so if Michelle Ferrari was provincial, a provincial conservative, uh, a Ford conservative, as it were, she'd be a provincial MPP. And if she were running provincially, you know, I wouldn't be surprised to see her as a minister of, of education. I don't know what the ministry as she would have in a Polyev government, but I have Does zero doubt that with, with her communication skills, <laughs> she would be maybe not a senior minister, but a minister and the media would just eat it up because every day Michelle Ferrari would give them a, a juicy red apple. Oh, uh, Charles, you couldn't have said it better. I, I, I see in the people are like deathly afraid. I know there are a lot of people in the content game that are like, you know, 12 bell alert, Michelle Ferrari might be the minister of something. And I'm like, oh, please. Like you can't, you can't sneak that one by me. It's like, Hey, listen, there's upside here too. If Pierre Pauly have wins, you guys might be angry and he might do some dumb shit and he might, well, he guaranteed we'll do some dumb shit on the international and domestic stage and we'll all laugh. Ha ha ha. But that, that woman is a sitting member of parliament had no idea how the different levels of provincial no, and federal no, government no. didn't know that they were separate entities what? and is literally being schooled 
by her live-in boyfriend at the time because he ran for the conservatives and the the look on his face like when she must have gotten elected that night a couple of years ago yeah. must have been spectacular because this woman has no clue how any of it works and she walks around and this is the thing that I, I love about politics in 2024 she's got that bobert energy that mgt energy right or mtg energy where it's like rah, 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 rah. she literally under the surface has no idea how her industry works like none I think you I think you meant MTG Marjorie Taylor Green, right? That's Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Marjorie so Marjorie Taylor Green uh in Georgia she still thinks that she's eligible to be a uh, vice president if Donald Trump is is president and Marjorie Taylor Green um probably isn't uh, as at quite as dumb as she appears in in videos but you know she's no Einstein and Marjorie Taylor Green raises more money than just about anybody on earth because uh, the the people who send her money and they send her money from all over the United States, not just Georgia. Um, they they relate to her, you know. She is she is one of them, and uh, you know they, they, nobody will ever accuse Marjorie Taylor Greene of talking down to anybody. Yeah, <laughs> you can't be that low on the ground and talk down to people. But you know, even though that sounds elitist and snobbish on my part, from the perspective of a lot of people who are in part of that kind of that that populist uh, convoy, and that they would see me as elitist and snobbish and Laurentian elite and whatever the, the silly slogans are. Mm -hmm. But they love the Marjorie Taylor Greens, and uh, there's no doubt in my mind, uh, they love the Michelle Ferrari. She's she's real, man. She's oh, real. Man. She doesn't get more real than that. That's why Doug Ford's got that folksy love in this province, right? It's like, the guy could be a total criminal, but yeah, he's just this folksy idiot. You got to keep him in office. Like, <laughs> yeah. Having spent so many years in Ontario, there's another thing. It's one of the things that, that, that delights me about life, and I know you... You, you feel that it's, it's not fair that I'm being mercenary, but I mean, I, 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 I know Ontario like the, the back of my hand and the idea that Doug Ford is still a smashing success. I mean, just, I'm sorry. just I find it hilarious. Oh, without question. But nobody looks at it through this humorous lens, right? Okay. People look at it through this fatal critical lens like, oh, my God, this is going to be, oh, my God. This is gonna be. Listen, in Ontario, is shit more expensive? Totally. Do I love this province? Absolutely. Is Doug Ford still robbing the province by and total criminal? Yes. Is he really, really intellectually stupid and dishonest? A hundred percent. But, dude, you got to look around the room. Like, Michelle Ferrari, literally, we just played it for her. She's like, wait a second. Like, that's how that works. Like, I don't know. She is getting an MP salary and she's a federal leader. People use the word right honorable in front of Michelle Ferrari when they introduce her. That right honorable woman has no idea how her industry works. I just played it for her. She's like, wait a second. So like the progressive. But, but, I, would, I, would, I, are but I would kill. I would kill. I mean, the, the conversation with the boyfriend is, is yeah. interesting, but I would kill <laughs> to watch a 30 minute video of Ford and Ferrari, right? Yeah. Michelle Ferrari and Doug Ford trading electoral reform <laughs> ideas. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I know that, you know, some Western Canadians will get a yeah. little ticked if I say that, but I have to say this. Some of the smartest people in the world do live in Toronto. I know people want to hate on Toronto, but, but, but Toronto, whether it's the universities, whether it's the tech community, the business yeah. community, uh, the manufacturing community, you know, the, 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 Toronto has some of the smartest people in the world. And I, I've been privileged in my life to meet many of them. And that's yeah. why when I, I, I look at <laughs> Doug Ford and, and mo most of them do vote for Doug Ford, you know, I mean, yeah. they, they do, they do. And they don't vote for him because they think he's smart. They just, they vote PC. Yes. And when I was in Ontario, I too voted PC. Me and too. for all I know, if I were in Ontario right now, once again, blood on my hands, if I were in Ontario right now, I guess the chances are high that I too would vote PC. I think I you would. I can't even say it. <laughs> <laughs> dude it is incredibly entertaining out here like to your point federally we have that provincially yeah and and yet like at the start of the week just so, and folks just relax okay like if pierre polyev wins this is what you're gonna get yeah. you, you get a precursor here in ontario the guy had to walk back every single bill he tried to institute over the past year on monday after taking an 11 week vacation because he's under criminal investigation by the rcmp for international collusion and money laundering so like folks if you're sitting there going this is an outrage. <laughs> Enjoy the reporting on the outrage, people. Like, just relax. We are governed by absolute morons. 
and it can be fun too. So everybody enjoy it. If Pierre Polyev wins, Minister of Education for Michelle Ferrari sounds like a lovely title. Lovely. Anyway, Michelle Ferrari will not be the Minister of Education because even though Michelle doesn't know it, she's a federal member of <laughs> She doesn't know it. She didn't. She didn't in that conversation. She didn't even know who she worked for. She's she like, wait know. a second. I who work am for I? The... <laughs> <laughs> Pierre Bolli is famous for famous for asking, who are you? Who do you work for? <laughs> At these new, so-called news conferences. <laughs> I still laugh myself silly about that because when he asks you, who you are, because he goes by a different name and no one knows who he is or where he's from. It's attend, the best. You, you can't attend any of those news conferences no. unless you're accredited. The idea that he doesn't know who these people are. There is it's not like it's the US Marine Corps. We're not talking about thousands of people there. We're talking about a handful of people. He knows every one of them and he knows who they work for. He just yeah. wants to hear lines like CBC or CBC or CP, and then he goes into his oh, you know, our tax dollars are subsidizing you. You're speaking for Trudeau, and you know, and Trudeau and, and, and all of these reporters are way too polite uh, to respond to his question with "Who are you?" Yeah, who well, are the you? Second, Jeff? someone does to your point. I wrote an article on that and, last and, week. Who are you, and and who do you who do you work for? Who do you uh, really work well, for? Actually, there's the question, yeah, Pierre. Yeah, I'd like to turn it around. Who are you? Why did you used to be called Jeff? And who do you really work for, bud? Yeah. Let me know. Charles Adler, ladies and gentlemen. Charles Adler podcast. You can download anywhere you get your fine podcasts. Google, Apple, Spotify. You can also go to YouTube, Cryer Media. You can download it there as well. Uh, you can follow him on Twitter, at Charles Adler. Very funny follow. And also, he'll be your conscience. He's one of those guys who's like a Twitter handrail where you're like, I'm going to tweet this. And then you go and see what Charles tweeted, and you're like, I might want to dial it back. Maybe that's just me. Uh, but really appreciate you being here to kind of make some sense, have some fun, talk a little bit about where we're at. Uh, and uh, thanks again. Really appreciate you having some time with us. Today. One one question to throw out to Pierre Paulia for any yeah. reporter who gets asked, who do you work for? Here's, here's, here's how you respond. If you just want to tickle his fancy, as it were, ask the question you uh, this way, sir, you know who I work for. My question is, do you work for Venezuela? <laughs> he's in the soup now charles is in the soup everybody do you work for venezuela do or do you ask, know anyone who does just, just ask the harmless question do you work for venezuela and let's see what happens i don't mind like the odd kindergarten cop reference to our schwarzenegger who is your daddy and what does he do that might be fun i mean there's so many things you could ask that gentleman but just go with what charles is saying uh, you know who i am who are you who are you baby <laughs> Charles Who Adler, loves you? Who loves you? I, I love you. I love. I love Canada. Uh, yeah, we can. We can talk about the serious <laughs> stuff. But let's please, please, let's just stay Canadian. Let's never. Let, let's never take ourselves too seriously. And Jeff, I'm talking to you too. <laughs> Marlena, Bob, Tim, Alan, all of you guys. Uh, Charles Adler, go and download his podcast. You're get your fine podcast. Thanks, buddy. Great to see you again, as always, Mister yeah. at Charles Adler on Twitter is where you can find him. <sighs> It's like therapy for me talking to that gentleman. It is. It sells me down every time. It's funny because like uh, when I first started doing some of the stuff, specifically working with Charles, ooh, I, I just, what a blessing to have that man in my life. And when I first started working with Charles, I'd call him. I'm like, can you believe this? And he'd go, ha, 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 that's where this comes from. Right now, distraction. Don't worry about it. So I'm like, okay, okay. He settle you down. And then you call him back like four minutes later. Like they're doing it again. They said this. Somebody, he's like, yeah, well, it's the war on Christmas. It's like a 60-year-old strategy. Don't worry about it. And he calms you down. He has helped me see the forest through the political trees, and he can do the same for you. He and Kinsella do a great podcast every Friday. Go and download, subscribe to his podcast anywhere you get your fine podcast, the Charles Adler Podcast. He'll settle you down. Then he'll give you something to think about. Then he'll tell you the truth. Uh, speaking of the truth, we are brought to you by our friends at factcheck.io. Factcheck.io, do you believe... Uh, this is fact-checking software extensions that not only help you battle misinformation and disinformation in real time, gives you the complete epistemology and origin of where that information came from, whether it's organic and inorganic. And right now, right now, folks, factcheck.io. If you go to www.factcheck.io, you can sign up for the beta test of the program. Uh, this is software that does not exist. It is all proprietary, and it will be free. 
and you have a chance to actually navigate agency on social media and with the things that you read. Nothing like this exists. And the reason why, because the second it does, it gets snapped up uh, because people don't want you to believe certain things. We want to give you facts. We want to give you truths, alternative sources, and we want to give you trust scores. That is exactly what Fact Check is. If you want to believe, go to factcheck.io today. Go there right now. We've got a limited space. For, they've got limited space for their sign-up, for their beta test. So you can beta test anything that you want to check to see if it's real. It is the ultimate tiebreaker, factcheck.io. We're also brought to you by Cantorque, makers of rugged, hardworking torque wrenches in beautiful Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. God love the people in Edmonton. God love the people in Alberta. Hardest working individuals that make the most rugged, hardworking torque wrenches. 20 years of experience, tool rentals, calibration, service repairs, custom fabrication, distribution opportunities. Cantorque offers a range of services and products as well as distribution opportunities. That means work. They'll give you a job. If you know anything about the torque metal industry, or you know anything about bolting and solution needs, specifically when it comes to torque wrenches, these guys are the best. 20 years of unparalleled expertise, heavy industry around the world, forestry, machinery, nuclear, uh, heavy equipment. It doesn't matter. These guys do it for every, including tunnel boring machines. Yeah, they're the only people that can service them in some places because they have a solution that works and other people don't. That's why they call themselves Cantorque, everything in Canada by Canadians. Also brought to you by our friends at Muse on the Mic. The ladies, Emily and Riley, have a brand new podcast, owners of Muse Massage Spa in Toronto. Uh, Canada's premier body rub parlor. Go to musemassagespa.com for more details. These are educators, sexologists, and advocates, and their podcast is as such. It is outstanding. They take you to behind the scenes. They talk about what they can do for sex work industries. They talk about it being an industry that any woman or man should look at as a professional industry, and then safety, standards, all that stuff. But they also operate a hell of an operation out of Toronto. It's called Muse Massage Spa. Go there today, musemassagespa.com, and you can check them out on their podcast as well. They've got a Patreon version that gets very uncensored. You'll enjoy that. Uh, Muse on the mic Patreon, Muse on the mic anywhere you get your fine podcast, including at Cryer Media. Go to Cryer.co today for that as well. And we're always brought to you by our friends at Gitch, any engineered for any level of performance as well as everyday life. Luxury boxer briefs. You'll love these. Boxer briefs, black, purple. Red, orange. I prefer the black. Not a fan of the orange. A lot of people like orange gitch. I'll wear the purple, dig the red, love the black. But you can get a four pack or a single. Uh, and right now you can get a free pair when you use promo code gitch3 at checkout when you buy three or more. So the fourth is free. If it's free, it's for me. And you also get 15% off your entire purchase when you give me your email address. Go to edsfineimports.com today. Download all their information. Shop their massive clothing selection, clothing for men and boys. And make sure you use that promo key, uh, that promo code GITCH3 at checkout when you buy three or more pairs of underwear. These are the best underwear on the planet, by the way. Engineer for any level of performance. I wear them every day. You should too. All of my friends wear them. A bunch of our clients now wear them. And they are selling out. So make sure you go today at defineimports.com. Get you three as your promo code. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks to Mr. Adler for joining us. Uh, don't forget everything we do is at Cryer Media, Cryer.ca. Rate, subscribe, and review YouTube, Cryer Media on YouTube, and Dean Blundell Show on YouTube. Follow us on Twitter, anywhere you get your fine social media posts, including Twitter, I think Instagram. Yeah, we're on Instagram, Facebook as well, Cryer Media, Dean Blundell. Have a nice day, everybody. We love you.